welcome everyone Hello. for uh, this very interesting webinar in the series that uh, we are conducting we had the first one on monday i'm going to request dilip chinoy of uh, picky to do the brief introduction and then we'll get started with the main business of the day and i'll uh, and outline the uh, format of the session once we begin dilip over to you if you could do a brief introduction uh, for uh, both of us and then uh, i'll take over from there uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, cyril uh, first of all good morning everybody and i hope that uh, all of you and your families and your people in your extended organization are all safe it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this webinar on covid-19 global changes and managing transition uh, as uh, cyril said this is the second in the series of the partnership between cyril amarchand mangaldas and fiki and uh, i think today's conversation will provide guidance on global changes due to the corona pandemic uh, and how do we manage uh, transition with a very special focus on force majeure Uh, on behalf of Fiki, I would like to thank Cyril Amarchand Mangaldas for partnering with us for this series of webinars and sharing their insights with members. I'm extremely delighted to once again welcome uh, Mr. Cyril Shroff, Chairman Fiki Corporate Laws Committee, and uh, Dr. Abhishek Singhvi, Senior Advocate and Member of Parliament. Um, Dr. Singhvi uh, needs no introduction. Uh, also, uh, all of you would be aware that uh, Dr. Singhvi is a senior three-term. sitting member of the rajya sabha uh, is a well known as india's foremost senior advocate and jurist uh, he is a former chairman of the parliamentary standing committee on law and justice uh, at the age of uh, 34 he was india's youngest designated uh, senior advocate and uh, at the age of 37 in uh, i won't say the year because then he will be revealing his age but india's youngest appointed additional uh, solicitor uh, solicitor general there a lot of you would have actually seen him on television as spokesperson for uh, the party in uh, and also uh, many of you on the call i'm sure have engaged his counsel at some point of time i think beyond this formal uh, introduction uh, i've known dr singhvi for many many years he has been an important uh, member you know the young group in the world economic forum and uh, again like i said uh, these words actually don't uh, really describe his eminence and what he has contributed in his in his uh, in his career but now i will hand over to cyril and invite our extreme panelists uh, to share their thoughts on the subject a very warm welcome to everybody and a special welcome to dr singh bhai thank you several for leading this uh, thank you dilip uh, and thank you for the opportunity to partner with fikki on this i think fikki uh, sort of affects and is sort of comprised of so many stakeholders in uh, indian society and it's a great platform for us to collectively participate uh, in this conversation now my warm welcome to dr singhvi as well now we also go back a very long time Uh, and I've known each other for several decades, and uh, every time I hear him, uh, I always marvel at his uh, intellect and his eloquence, and the way he can take some of the most complex problems uh, and explain them in, in in simple terms. So today our topic is uh, about force majeure and material adverse change clauses. These are two sister concepts, but have a certain Uh, sort of philosophical link with each other. So the format of the uh, the afternoon is going to be that I will shortly hand over to Dr. Singhvi, who will lead the discussion on force majeure, frustration, and that whole uh, topic. And Dr. Singhvi has, in particular, deep knowledge of this because, apart from the many uh, many cases, some of the uh, the most landmark cases, including the energy watchdog case. and more recently the delhi high court uh, ordered three days ago as well which involves similar concepts he was the lead counsel in uh, in those cases so he is intimately aware of this subject after he finishes in about 35 minutes then i will talk about a sister concept of the material adverse change or mac material adverse change a material adverse event as it is known and what practical implications it has uh, on transactions and after we both finish Then we will do a little bit of Q and A amongst ourselves, and then open it up to the virtual floor for the questions. 
So with these remarks, uh, Dr. Smriti, uh, let me hand over to you. And once again, thank you very much for doing this. I know you had to return some very important work to be on this call. So I'm especially grateful to you for uh, having that. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Cyril and uh, Dilip. Uh, thank you for a very generous introduction. You know, uh, as luck would have it, yesterday at 10 o'clock, uh, something was filed in the Supreme Court, which started hearing bang at 11. So I have somehow excused myself from there. And let us see how it goes, where the multitasking can extend to two Zoom conferences, one later. But uh, be that as it may, having thanked you for a very generous introduction, I must tell you that the old definition of Kali Yuga used to be when uh, brothers in the family start fighting. A definition of the current Kali Yuga would might well be that we are lurching from one virus to another. Because the last time I did a big webinar, I was cautioned against use of Zoom. It turns out that the British Parliament the other day has no worries about Zoom virus and discussed the COVID virus on Zoom for a long time. So I think we're all safe. As they say, uh, Every uh, cloud has a silver lining. Many adversities have opportunities. One lighter one, which COVID has spawned, is a huge progeny of COVID jokes. And I think we should be fortunate in looking at the lighter side of COVID. My two favorite ones are the ones where the, uh, uh, the, the Psychiatrist Association issued a circular to many of its practicing members and also to its patients saying that during lockdown, it is quite normal for people to talk to plants, spots, trees, and if they are married to their wives occasionally. But there is no need to contact a psychiatrist if people start doing that. Then they added a note in below that, that you must, however, contact us if you think that the pots, plants, and pets are applying back to you during COVID. The other short, funny one was when a lady, when a pharmacist is supposed to have fainted, when a lady visited to the pharmacy, asked for a mask matching her sari. Friends, be that as it may, let us now turn to the topic without beating about the bush too much. And before I start on the topic, let me tell you what we are discussing and what we are not discussing. Because that clarity is important. I will deal mainly with force major issues, which include frustration, impossibility, and the whole gamut. And then touch upon at the end on specific issues like wages and uh, some interesting uh, extraterritorial legislative measures, for example, from Singapore recently, which should be a model for India. But I am going to speak of legal principles, rules, judgments, statutes laid down by law, what the positive law is. I am not here in the first part of my, uh, I will address it at the end, speaking of the normative ought. Also, I am not speaking of consensual, with grace, equitable adjustments, arrangements, compromises, which is the best way to behave during crises. I am obviously talking when there is confrontation, when there is litigation, when there are adversarial positions. And what, from a legal standpoint, a court may hold, might hold, etc. First and foremost, by way of and this is important that the first and foremost test would be by way of contract, what the contract between the parties says. Then by way of application of statutory law to that contract. Then by way of analyzing the cases about that. That's what a court does when people are fighting. Also, I would largely, largely be speaking about the general law because I can't deal with specific contractual clauses. That incidentally requires a fee for proper consultation. And uh, the general principle must be remembered that a contractual clause in any event is always supreme. It overrides, it's paramount. That is what governs. So if there's a dispute between you and me. What is the contract between us? The exact language governs. Everything else comes later. But the general law, which is statutory law and case law, applies because, as they said, lawyers are not uh, prophets and clients are not astrologers. So most contractual clause imperfectly cover the whole subject. And that is why an understanding of the law is useful. Broadly, I intend to proceed as follows. I'll tell you something briefly about the two major sections of the Indian law. And for those of you, because all of you are deemed, obviously it may be a deeming fiction, but you're deemed to be all intelligent, inquisitive, inquisitive, curious listeners. And those who want to look into it can look into two sections of the law, which I'll mention just in a moment. 
and also if you are even more inquisitive and more diligent and uh, hard working then uh, maybe read four out of thousands of cases and after doing telling you that i will then tell you what i have culled out as principles from the entire gamut of jurisprudence obviously a need in a haystack exercise but i will try and do that and then uh, tell you at a third level as to how in actual practice uh, this concept has been applied in fact situations that you'll be surprised how difficult and how high the threshold in theory is for force major of frustration to apply and thereafter come to some specific examples as i said of wage issues of some foreign jurisprudence like a chinese judgment and the singapore statute and then we will leave it to uh, cyril to deal with something very technical in corporate law mae which is another fascinating area not fully developed in india yet and thereafter q and a so friends uh, for those of you who are interested you need to just see section 32 and section 56 of the contract act the indian contract act which kind of codifies the law on this subject which was scattered all over english uh, common law and without boring you with legalistic details because i appreciate most of you are non lawyers and supposed to be non lawyers 32 is a section of the indian contract act which deals with contingent contracts a simple principle that a contract to do something or not to do something dependent on a future event will be void if that event does not happen it becomes unenforceable so that is 32 codifies the contingency but it relates to impossibility and frustration 56 is more directed again codifies 700 years, 500 years of english law into the frustration or what the french used to call the force majeure clause force majeure is a french adaptation of latin on from which french arose latin called it vis major but vis major was a more technical narrower term about earthquakes lightning floods force majeure is a much wider term including legal impossibility and it has two parts the first part of 56 says to do an act impossible in itself there is a word for the statute if you have a contract like that then it is void and unlike a lot of other countries our framers two eminent englishmen uh who were force were very patronizing and somewhat abusive towards india and are rightly criticized for that but who were admittedly of outstanding brilliance macaulay who did our civil procedure criminal procedure and indian penal code and subsequently stephen a lesser person than macaulay who was a giant but still a brilliant lawyer who did our evidence act and contract act and they have helpfully put illustrations so in the 32 section example of contingent contracts it gives illustrations of the statute itself for example a contract between a and b for a to buy b's house if a survives c now unless and until if if c dies earlier then that contingent contract is impossible of performance it gives more illustrations like this as far as the 56 is concerned an agreement to do an impossible act in itself starts with the illustration for example that a contract to do to discover treasure by magic that's void per se as this as lawyers say impossible to conceive and do the other part of 56 says contracts which may by supervening legality or events become impossible and the classic old english example from 200 300 years ago which is codified in our 56 is of a singer who agrees to perform on dates x and y and on these those dates in one example she falls ill genuinely and seriously which is a question of fact or the auditorium is burnt down so these are supervening impossibilities which the illustration of our statute say would be actionable as force majeure but that is more by way of a backdrop because that's the general indian law in statute if you are remember there is uh, about 500 years of british case law and 70 years of english case law so to suggest you that you might profitably read four judgments is obviously an oversimplification uh, but if you would like you should read bangar in 1954 judgment written incidentally by what who i consider one of the two or three most brilliant judges um, we ever had just as bk mukherjee the second person to die in office and if you most people don't know this if you will read uh, he's there's an anecdote about the fact that nehru wanted bk mukherjee to succeed as chief justice of india in the early 50s after patanjali shastri and overlooking mahajan 
Mukherjee told Nehru that he would not take the post of Chief Justice because Mahajan was his senior. And he said further that if you insist, I will resign. Of course, all turned out well because Mahajan did become Chief Justice and Mukherjee became the subsequent Chief Justice. Unfortunately, only the second person then to have died in office right on the last day of his retirement. But a brilliant man. He wrote Banga. And the other judgment, which is seminal, is another brilliant judge currently on the Supreme Court, Justice Nariman, Energy Watchdog, 2017. In between, if you are more diligent, you might read two more. As I said, four in all. Alopi Prashad of 1960 and Nehati of 1968. But I'll come to them on the factual analysis later. Let me first try and call out uh, this 500 years of English law, our two sections and 70 years of Indian law into say seven, eight, ten broad principles of law. At the moment, we are normative on or positive law. Uh, obviously, it's the job of a fan dancer. I'm touching upon the subject without really covering it because there's a huge amount of jurisprudence on this subject. The first is that uh, these are just principles I'm kind of telling you for ease. The first is that force majeure is a much wider word than mere physical incapacity, like earthquakes, etc., which is the difference, as I said, between vis majeure and force majeure. The second is that English law now is only of persuasive value because we have our own codification in Indian statute, the two sections I told you, and in 70 years of Indian jurisprudence. But English law is still probably the one most relied on in this area because that's where this origin comes from. We have gone far ahead in India on constitutional law, on public law than any other country in the world. But on these issues of contract law, English law is still of highly persuasive value. The third very important principle is what is the juristic principle underlying this whole doctrine? And that was very well discussed in the Indian judgment of Nehati. But uh, there were three doctrines and I want to just place them because the philosophical doctrine underlying is always useful to know. And which one should we choose is the other question I will ask you and then answer it myself. One doctrine is that frustration arises from the juristic principle of obviousness of an implied term. A and B contract and uh, A and B believe that some term is so obvious that it need not be placed in the contract at all. So that if there is that event which occurs, people will say, oh, it's so obvious. We always assumed without mentioning it that if that occurs, our bargain is off. That's known as the implied intent principle where the court supposedly applies the presumed intent of parties or something obvious which they did not say. The second is the court saying if this event which the parties never wrote in their contract, never thought of, happens, um, what would a reasonable man do? You know, the joke is that the whole of law is based on the mythical, perhaps non-existent reasonable man. In every area of law, judges apply the test of reasonable man. So they apply it here also. This is a more external objective test, but still based not on what the judge says or thinks, but what a reasonable man in a similar situation would do. That's the second juristic principle. And some cases have followed the first, some the second. A third one is what Lord Denning, and Lord Denning, as you know, was famous for just simply doing justice as to what he thought was just and fair and proper. It's the pure external test, which says that now a situation has arisen which neither party contemplated. So how do I, as a judge, do complete justice between the parties? Now, immediately when you see this threefold classification of mine, you see that the first what you call the presumed intent test is in a sense farcical because the parties never really thought of it. Had they thought of it, they would have said it somewhere. And to presume an intent of parties when they never thought of it is farcical. The third is unacceptable because it allows a judge to become a party. The third one, which is the justice external test, the full objective test. Virtually, the judge starts rewriting a contract. He says, today this has happened, parties did not think of it, I'll rewrite the contract for them. That is equally impermissible because it leaves the anchor of the contract. Therefore, I prefer the middle one. A situation arises, neither party contemplated. Well, do what a reasonable man in a similar situation would have done. And that also is the preponderance of judicial opinion follows that principle. Now the question arises as to what is the real meaning of frustration or of uh, force majeure, as they call it. And these words are used interchangeably, although, although there is a technical legal difference, which I will not bore you with. I'm using them interchangeably, as most cases have done. As I said, I'm oversimplifying from principles, but it, the words I'm using are not my words. 
they are judicial words over 500 years and 70 years. And it is only to illustrate and underline how very, very high is the threshold to invoke force majeure and impossibility. In other words, those of you who optimistically thought COVID is around everything here and now, we can start invoking force majeure. The actual common law legal test is very high, very difficult to satisfy by the person who's invoking. And before I come to contemporary times, we must understand so that the common anecdotal notion of impossibility is not what the law says it is. So the words used are strikingly, and these words are important, they're all from cases. Change circumstances must destroy altogether the basis of the adventure and its underlying object with which the party started. Destroy altogether the basis of the adventure. Next, no frustration merely because the mode and manner is perforce altered. Third, parties must be taken to have assumed lots of risks, which we will not protect them from. Risks of price increase and decrease, risk of depreciation in currencies up and down, etc. It is not the job of courts to absolve parties of what they contractually took on, unless we are able to find as a court that virtually a new contract is made by the supervening uh, frustrating event. So the test is, there must be a break, this is again the court's words, not mine, break in identity from the previous contract, so much so that what the court is now looking because of the supervening event is virtually a new contract itself. Otherwise, they said, we will not allow you the excusing circumstance of a force majeure. Otherwise, we will even hold you to an absolute bargain, howsoever onerous. And two things that really emphasize, onerousness itself is not sufficient. Price itself is not sufficient. It must be such a hindrance as to fundamentally alter the contract, to fundamentally alter the substratum of the bargain. Now, just this very quick list, which is of course paraphrased by me, but culled out from 500 years English law and 70 years Indian law, tells you that what we, by popular imagination, think of is not what frustration is. Let us now come to the third part of my address. How have these principles been applied in Indian law? Now, there are hundreds of cases, thousands possibly in England. I don't have time for that. So I'll just tell you these four major cases I mentioned. This again illustrates how frustration was rejected in each of these four by applying a very high threshold. The first was the Bangar case by B.K. Mukherjee, which I reminded you. It was the case where a party A agreed with B, B was a developer, to develop plots and sell a whole complex of development, post-development. And the party A had bought a couple of plots or maybe, you know, one of them. This is in the aftermath of the war, the Second World War. Although the case is decided later, but the context arose in the war, during the war. During the war, as luck would have it, the government requisitioned. Requisition as opposed to acquisition is a relatively temporary measure. For the war effort, they requisitioned this whole parcel of land, including this party's land and the developer's land. The requisition is taken up for defense purposes, for putting an ordnance factory, for putting a soldiers, etc. So the uh, builder developer made a very fair offer, which I thought was a fair offer, that you either take your money back or take the land as it is on an as-is, where-is basis because we can't know when the requisition will end. After all, war is also quite uncertain. And requisition is, there's no date put to a requisition. The court rejected the plea of frustration by the builder and held, gave specific performance to the chap who said, I only want my developed land. And in doing so, it emphasized one feature, which is why a lot of COVID claims are in danger. It says, the, the non-permanence, the non-semi-permanence, and the temporariness is crucial. Even though there is war, even though there is requisition, it is inherently temporary. It doesn't fundamentally alter or destroy the bargain. It doesn't make a swallow out of a, a swan out of a crow or a crow out of a swan. The second case, Alopi, came later, and uh, it was the so-called Ghee case. Both Alopi and Nehati are decided by two Gujarati judges. One of them a very fierce, aggressive intellectual giant, J.C. Shah of the Shah Commission fame. And uh, Nehati by another Gujarati, a very mild, just the polar opposite. A very famous, but a very mild judge. Shalit. So the Alopi Ghee case 
was where Alopi supplied again in the army context. It happened in the context of the war again. And he kept supplying, but in the middle of the war, he told them that, look, A, it's impossible to source my ghee for you, the army. B, the price is much more. And therefore, I'm giving you notice that you have to pay me more, even though I'll keep supplying. He said this orally, occasionally in writing, the army kept on nodding, did not say anything in writing. War ended, Alopi claimed higher price. Court said, tough luck. It is tough. You had difficulties procuring it. Maybe you had an increase in price. It doesn't alter the fundamental nature of the contract, so we will not give you benefit of force measure, which would have been either a voiding of the contract or an enhanced price given to him. The third is Nehati by Justice Shellett in the late 60s, where person A was supplying Pak, Pakistan sourced jute, again in the context of the post-65 war. This is post-65 war. And the buyer was A. And one of the conditions was that because it's Pakistani sourced, it requires a license before you can supply. There was no ban, but it was a kind of a regulatory measure. Now, the case is interesting because it argued on two bases. One, the court said it is not a ban. And it's a case-by-case -case rejection or acceptance of license. The seller pleaded that he could not get the license, so he could not perform. So they said, tough luck. That doesn't mean that we'll allow force measure. You must pay damages to the buyer. But then there's an interesting passage which says, even if there was an embargo, we'll have to see the embargo. And unless the embargo is absolutely permanent, saying nobody should supply jute from Park anytime ever, we will not hold it to be a frustrated contract. I'm just giving these examples to show how far the courts went in how high threshold the courts applied. Quite contrary to your, what your popular misconception was, possibly contrary to my own conception. And I must here uh, notify you that uh, my son, who the lawyer, helped me a lot in this research, old material. And both Ms. Gauri and Mr. George of Cyril's firm helped me when I kept asking them questions and they supplied me very useful material. But uh, you know how your perception changes when you go in deep into the history of it. Now we come to the most important contemporary times, which all of you as speaky listeners are most interested in. That's Energy Watchdog, as I said by another brilliant judge, Rohit Nine 2017 judgment, I had the privilege or the misfortune to argue for the losing party, a very well-known corporate of India. Now here it's interesting because there was a electricity contract to supply electricity. And there were many corporates, I was the main one, where the contract everybody knew in my case was based upon getting Indonesian coal. Now we were able to prove and the court accepted A, that Indonesian coal price increased exponentially manifold many times over by law, by decree of Indonesian law. Two, that virtually I would be supplying at X rupees. I mean, the cost of my supply would be X rupees. And the price tariff which I'm forced to charge is X minus Y. And I said, I can't be forced to supply out of pocket. That was a square plea for Danis whom I represented. The court in the first part, of course, held that there is no clause in the PPA which says that you shall supply only source that is on Indonesia. So that's a more factual answer. So the contract is not based, they found only on Indonesian law. But we accept that you suffered a huge increase. Well, the answer in force major is tough luck. They cited a very interesting House of Lords 1962, a Greek ship case called Sakari Gloas, where a ship, right if you remember in 62, was the Suez crisis, was contracted to supply very valuable material and obviously everybody passed through the Suez because it saved almost nine tenths of the distance. Suez crisis meant the Suez Canal closed. So the ship owner and the, consign and the carrier said, look, you have to either pay me more or you have to abrogate the contract. I can't, you know, not supply through the Suez now that's closed. The court house of laws in 62, which just in the 11 sites in 2017, said tough luck. We again emphasize the alternative mode of performance available. That's another very major test. The alternative mode of performance, which you and I might not like, is you better go down the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa and come up to England, you have an alternative. It's not a radically new bargain which has emerged. It's not a fundamentally new contract which has happened. And the burden on those who claim for FM is very, very, very high, is what the court said in Energy Watch. And it again quoted cases which underline that uh, price alone is always given the least, repeat, least importance. Price can be a factor only if the other factors work. But if you only go shouting price, 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 difficult for me, possible for me, onerous for me, that the court says the weakest link 
in a force majeure clause. Well, friends, this gives you an idea of where we started, where we have landed in more recent times. We now come to some tenancy examples. The tenancy example is that obviously everybody says you have a house, you're not able to use it. You have an office, you're not able to use it. You have a multiple offices. I believe I read just now ICICI sought waiver or diminution on 5,300 branches it has. And so look at so many paradigms you can have a residential office. Uh, as I said, first and foremost has to be contract. No option. Tough luck. What are the contractual terms? As I said, since lawyers and clients are not astrologers, soothsayers or prophets, nobody has thought of pandemics most, in most cases. But where you have specifically, then your terms of contract will come. But in a general sense, it is difficult, very difficult, because of the temporariness test, the non-permanence test. What do you have? You have ultimately a few months of inconvenience. Now, it is possible that for those months, rent may or may not be payable. That may be a matter of dispute. In many cases, the landlord may reduce. In some cases, you may fight. But in law, there are people who try to exit the tenancy, to abrogate, to walk out of a lock-in period. I don't think that is available on the current law. And I'll come to some details in a minute. There is a very amazing Chinese example, the most direct example. It's a 2003 judgment. When I say Chinese, it's a Hong Kong judgment, which is Chinese in 2003. Specifically on SARS, S-A-R-S, the immediate precursor of COVID. And it's applying English law because Hong Kong applies English law, not Chinese law. Although it's Chinese court. And a very well-written judgment, although by a district court, where A, the landlord gave to B, the tenant, with a lock-in of two years. For about a month or two months, he had to leave his premises right in the beginning because of uh, not COVID, but SARS. And after two months, he could come back. There's a lockdown there in Hong Kong. And he said, look, you keep the money I give you as earnest or as advance rent or as security, but I want to exit the lock-in. The court held no. He specifically relied on frustration. The court held no, no frustration. The contract has not become a new contract. The fundamental identity and link is not gone. It analyzed some interesting English cases, which I'm not telling you now, Cricklewood and Panaplos, etc. And then it made a very interesting content, uh, comment. It said, our survey of English law 500 years suggests that there is perhaps not a single case. This is that judgment saying, not me. Not a single English case where a tenancy can be walked out of or abrogated for force majeure. That gives you again an idea of what is happening in the tenancy area. Generally, as I said, contracts can vary. Your consensus with me, my grace with you, and equity, etc. can vary. And one very other important caveat I forgot to make in the beginning. Don't mix up between Indian courts, interim orders, and final orders. You know, India has the longest gap between these two, interim, interlocutory, and final. So there are a lot of orders passed where the judges behave on mercy, on compassion, on facts which are not fully known at the interim. You go to court, you get a stay. But we are now talking of what will happen after three years when the judgment comes. This law tells you that the judgment is likely to be against you. The fact that you've got an interim stay temporarily, temporary injunctions or orders mean that they get the pleadings subsequent, they get the papers subsequent, they look at the facts, and then give a reasoned order. It's only a prima facie interlocutory view, which people mistake for the law. The other example and why this uh, Kevin is useful. Is the other example was a matter I appeared in last week for Vedanta. It was an interlocutory order on the first day, and we have been given time to 13th. It's coming up next, next on May, to reply and argue it out. It was an interesting case where Halberton, the uh, oil major U.S. oil supplier, was to do things by mid 2019 to make wells for Kern, which is Vedanta in Rajasthan. Admittedly, it overshot the mark by months. But unfortunately or fortunately, Vedanta kept saying, no, you have to stick to the original plan, but we'll see. And they kept on promising to do it a few months later. And ultimately, they promised dates in January, February, and March 2020 to complete three wells. In Vedanta, while not formally agreeing, kept watching and saying, let's see whether you do it. Fortunately for them, 18th March, force mature was pleaded, saying that we were to complete by our notifications to you by 31st March which you do not really object to. And we are now in the last 15 days, we would have completed, but we've had COVID. Now the court has not decided that. There are lots of other factors in our case. For example, we are going to argue that um, they had problems from before. 
they were notified of breach, they were terminated, and COVID is only an excuse. Also, our argument is going to be that you see the nature of work, the leftover work or the left out work is certainly not doable in 15 days because the only COVID period is the last two weeks of March. But nevertheless, till such time that that is gone into, the court has to give a status quo regarding the bank guarantees, which we were invoking. The bank guarantee amounts are large. And if they don't give that state, then it in a sense becomes irreversible. But many of you mistake it to be the law. I don't think it's the law. The jury is out on that one. The judgment has to come. And it will be probably heard on 30 or shortly thereafter. The third uh, example is uh, construction contracts. Now, certainly, if there is a highway contract where you are prevented from working from date X to date Y because of COVID, I have no hesitation in saying that that period will have to be excluded for measuring your work progress or penalizing you for levying liquidated damages or doing termination. So if I terminate you or do LD for your non-work from X to Y, which is banned because of COVID, then I think that would be protected by a court. The more vexed question is, is it change of law for such a contractor, highway contractor? Because almost 99% of highway contracts have a change in law clause, which entitles additional compensation to the contractor. To that extent, I would agree with the contracting side that there is a change in law because COVID is a change in law, at least for lockdown. A lockdown is a law, clearly. And that operates as a change in law because it was not a law prior to the lockdown. The more vexed question is that having accepted this change of law, having excused you the troubled period, so to call, are you further entitled to compensation for change in law? I think the jury is out on that. I wrote an article recently on it, which I said the jury is out. No doubt the contractor has a claim in change of law, but equally the other party, for it to pay compensation, may well argue that it is also equally innocent. And, the, and this is a legal answer I am giving you. Possibly, I am giving you both sides of the argument. The contractor would have a strong argument that if you are giving me change of law, then give me compensation for it. The owner would have a similar argument saying, the change of law, no doubt, but the compensation is contemplated with that kind of change of law, which is relatable broadly or specifically to the activity in question. Not to a change of law, which is sector or activity neutral, which is what COVID is. COVID is not specific to construction contracts. COVID is not specific to tenancies. COVID is not specific, as they say, to gender, might, wealth, height, stature. It is sector person neutral. Whether additional compensation for change of law, such a situation of construction contract, I think it's a very arguable point. I don't think the contractor is a zero case, but I don't think that the uh, owner is a zero case also. It would be a vexed question. Let me end shortly uh, by coming to wages. And I'm sure we'll be thrashing it out more in questions and answers, but I'm giving you broad ideas for your minds to work and you know, this pretty much answers the vexed questions arising nowadays. Now, first and foremost, let me tell you that we are not talking of the normative. I would hate to find that I'm advising employers not to pay wages. I would hate to say that people should not be magnanimous, benign and benevolent during such trying times. Also, as a public figure, I believe very strongly and genuinely that I'm talking of the strict law purely as a lawyer. And that is this. 90%, this is the first point on wages, 90% of the letters, advisories, documents issued either by center or state government, please keep paying wages, don't stop, are nothing but that, advisories, recommendatory, no binding legal force. They are well-intentioned, they are noble, but we are not talking law. They can't be called. So that if somebody violate, uh, defies them, it's not law which you are defying. And therefore, perhaps, penal legal consequences cannot flow just by them. But, number two, an important caveat is that the letter of uh, the MHA, the Ministry of Home Affairs, which many of you may not know, is the nodal ministry for the Disaster Management Act. And virtually the secretary of the MHA is the ex-official chairman of the Disaster Management Authority, has issued on 29th March 2020 a document which can't be called a mere advisory or recommendation. It purports to be under section 10 bracket 2 bracket I of the Disaster Management Act. So to the extent that everything else is irrelevant, that irrelevance becomes irrelevant because there is a law 
which directs you to pay wages. It can't be said that a statutory notification under 10.2i of the DM Act is not law. That's point number two on wages. And one notification as good as 100 advisories. Point number three, however, if you ask me as a lawyer, is this a valid notification? Can it be challenged successfully? The answer is it can and should be and will be challenged. It already is challenged in a way in Maharashtra and Supreme Court also. According to me, two important points, sub points here. One, if it is challenged, you have to, should challenge both the notification and the section under which it is made. You have to challenge the validity of the section also, saying it is unconstitutional or ultra virus as law is use a technical word. That is because if you read section 10.2i, it does not appear to at all apply its mind, deal with, think of, or imagine wages anywhere. So it's a notification regarding wages issued under a section which has not dreamt of wages, which is why lawyers in technical parlance may legitimately call it ultra virus, and some court may accept that argument. But now the practical answer for those of whom who are going to be trigger happy on the basis of what I've said. The practical answer is that in the current context of destitution and deprivation, the chances that any court will interfere by an interim order to say, while you, we are discussing and hearing the matter, you need not pay wages because you've challenged the validity of the notification and the section. Well, I think we are fooling ourselves is highly, highly unlikely. Friends, as I end, I cannot but end by a very remarkable example. Many remarkable examples normally always come from Singapore, but I'd be less than uh, fair in without dealing with this. It's very recent. It's on 7th of April, 2020. And it shows you that a standard single statutory code to rule with COVID is the need of the hour for India. Now we have shifted from what is to what ought to be, from positive law to normative law. I think it's the crying need and we should follow the Singapore example, which is sadly and conspicuously absent in India. What does a code for COVID do? It makes for certainty. It makes for specificity. It makes for targeted, focused remedial results. It prevents litigation. It becomes a self-contained code and avoids confusion. What you have today is you have a patchy guideline or a single notification for wages. You have a patchy, other day I, got a, I saw a circular that the CCI and corporate lawyers have seen this, uh, will not consider it to be a cartel or match fixing under the competition code. New examples during and after COVID, which provide for cooperation between otherwise competing entities. It's a very interesting circular of 19th of April 2020, just a few days ago. CCI advisory, which basically means that look, normally we would consider or at least look into an anti competitive. Uh, effect, but now it is necessary for entities to cooperate and we want to encourage that cooperation and we will not come jumping down your backs because it is anti-competitive. Now, what is the point in the Singapore context? The point is interesting. The point is that you are having this patchy, disaggregated, diverse individual. You don't have a code. You don't have a, a centrality and a, and a focus, which is much needed. And for this, let me tell you about this very, very quickly. It's a very long code, and I will not take more than two or three minutes because I want to read the preamble. As I said, it's 7th of April in Singapore. An act to provide temporary measures and deal with other matters relating to the COVID 19 pandemic and to make consequential amendments to the Property Tax Act. Now, this is, of course, as I said, 30 40 pages statute. But the heart of it is two provisions that I'm oversimplifying is part two, the title of which is Temporary Relief for Inability to Perform Contracts. And under this part two, there is section five, relief measures. They first say in this five, one, this section applies to a case where ABC, they say, basically where COVID applies and a notification is served by party A to party B saying that COVID makes my performance not possible. Then five bracket two says, despite any law or anything to the, in the contract, so it overrides contracts. Another party to the contract may not take any action prescribed in relation to the subject inability until after the earliest of the following. A, the expiry of the prescribed period. And then they've gone and prescribed periods for different situations. The withdrawal of A's notification for relief because he has notified you that I am under COVID, I want relief, I am pleading personal. 
on an application, the assessor, if both parties don't agree and people are not as fair as to notify that I don't need to be, then an assessor makes a determination that the case is a question not one to which this section applies. Then they give 5.3, which is the most important. They give you specifically the categories to which this applies. Not like India where you are guessing. Category one is the commencement or continuation of an action in a court against A or his character or surety. The commencement or continuation of arbitral proceedings under the Arbitration Act against A or A's guarantor or surety. The enforcement of any security over immovable property. The enforcement of any security over any immovable property used for purpose of trade, business or profession. The making of an application under so-and-so section of the Companies Act for a meeting of creditors. Now this is 20 examples and I can't read them all for you. The appointment of a receiver or manager over property or undertaking. The commencement or levying of execution, distress or other legal process. On, on and on. Look at the clarity. Look at how simple it makes and how much litigation it avoids, how much time it avoids. This is the model. Here you, I've just given you three disaggregated examples. The circular on wages, a clarification by CCI, an ordinance notification the other day saying section 7, 9 and 10 of the IBC, rightly I say, will not apply during this time. A Supreme Court order where I appeared earlier at the beginning of lockdown saying all limitation stands proportionately extended. So this becomes patchy, ad hoc disaggregated and that's the real point I was making. Well friends, um, I have come to the end of what I wanted to say and of course we will elaborate both in civil questions and in your q and I hope you could all hear me right through. Thank you. Thank you doctor. Uh, you are brilliant and uh, I felt I was back again in college listening to uh, uh, a juristic exposition of the law. So thank you again for uh, simplifying 700 years of English law and 70 years of Indian law in 45 minutes. So it's like watching the Himalayas in a flash of lightning, but you can still get the contours of it. Thank you so much for that. So I would now like to talk about and examine the concept of material adverse change or, or material adverse event. It is a sister concept and is often spoken about together with force major. It is different in many ways. It has a few special features. Firstly, it's not in statute. You will not find the word material adverse change or material adverse event as part of a definition in any statute book. Where does it live? It lives in contracts and it lives in case law. There is no Indian case law. Most of the case law, most if not all the case law, is American case law in the courts of Delaware and New York. It has been a creation of the commercial world and of corporate lawyers like myself. And it is because of the 700 years of history of, of the law that we saw on how high a standard is required to be met when circumstances change and you want a different outcome of the contract or how parties would behave with each other, that the world of contractual architects and designers, and corporate lawyers have invented this. So you typically find it in uh, m and transactions, financing deals, and in passing in capital markets transactions and underwriting agreements. You may find it in other contracts as well, but the most likely place you will run into this is in m and deals or merger transactions. It's an interesting part of the toolkit of transactional lawyers and how wisely and skillfully you use it will depend upon how good a lawyer you have. I think this is probably testing time when you look back on your contracts to be able to assess on what the quality of the lawyering that you received when you constructed the contract. Because this is about legal imagination and legal skills in terms of how you allocated risk. Modern transactions and contracts are very sophisticated and typically agreements would run into many pages, sometimes hundreds of pages. To uh, reduce it to simple principles, what is the anatomy of a contract? Now, it can, uh, I can sort of overcomplicate it, but at its simplest, what does a contract do? Firstly, it establishes the factual basis on which parties transact. Why does A agree to buy a house from B? Why does a buyer agree to buy a target from the seller? So it establishes a factual basis. That is why you have diligence. That is why you have reps and warranties. And then you have the disclosures against them. It establishes the factual foundation. Secondly, what it does is it binds parties 
in a manner that will be enforced by a court or an arbitrator so it creates a binding relationship it describes the terms what conditions need to be fulfilled how much money has to be paid what is the sequence timing all of that and lastly and here is what is why this comes in it provides a risk allocation matrix a contract is nothing but a risk allocation framework gone are the days when contract would simply say that a will sell 100 widgets to b for 100 dollars and leave the risk allocation to the law or assume that the contract would be enforced no matter what those sort of contracts are not found anymore and common law and statutes have intervened and evolved over the hundreds of years of jurisprudence that uh, dr singh we talked about to find a way of creating a framework of relieving parties from performance section 56 of the contract act is one such example courts have applied common law concepts as well to provide for where there is a costless release or disengagement to provide it for when certain types of events happen but as we also heard that it is a very high standard. The basic rule is that it's a very high burden to be discharged. And ordinarily, the contract will be respected. The feet of the parties will be held to the fire and they'll be held accountable, even if it becomes onerous. Hardship is not an excuse, even if it arises from events that were not otherwise imagined. Now, what have corporate and transactional lawyers done? They have, they have reverse engineered this judicial reality, judicial and legislative reality, and created an invention for risk allocation, which is basically the material adverse here, MAT clauses. So the evolution of the MAT clause provides for proper allocation of risk, and the US court, particularly the courts of Delaware, have been the most forward in this. I see no reason why India will not do so as well. I think the COVID crisis will result in litigation, uh, which will end up in Indian courts. And I expect that when an English, when an Indian judge is looking to decide this, we'll look at these judgments delivered uh, overseas and we'll treat them as persuasive. So the material adverse same clause is basically a pre-agreed sequence of risk allocation. And, ex and it is basically provided to excuse a buyer from doing the deal or from a lender from financing when a MAC event occurs. It also, this clause or this definition of MAC or material adverse event has many cross linkages in the complex matrix of a, of a transaction document. It has linkages with the reps and warranties clause. It has linkages with conditions precedent. It has linked because one of the conditions precedent is that the reps and warranties as given would be valid both as of signing and closing. It has linkages with the termination provisions or any other remedies you could have provided that even if a MAC occurs, uh, depending on the severity of it, that the contract will not be terminated, but instead there would be damages or other remedies. So this is where typically you would find that these cross linkages, many of which are through subtle definitions, exclusions from definitions and exclusions from exclusions of definitions. And it's a complex piece of plumbing that holds the contract together. In simple terms, however, the way to look at a MAC clause is in three parts. First is the basic MAE. It's the primary clause. And it's usually a fairly short definition running into seven or eight lines. Then there is the exclusion from MAC. And then there is the exclusion from the exclusion. So a typical MAC clause has three parts to its body. The basic MAC the exclusion from the MAC and the exception to the exclusion. And the consequences of the three are very different. Looking at it now from the lens of risk allocation. As far as the basic MAC is concerned, what it does is that it puts the risk on the seller or in the case of a financing transaction on the borrower, the one who's taking finance. The next one, the exclusion, does exactly the opposite. It puts the risk on the buyer or the lender. And what the exception to the exclusion does is it does the exact opposite again. It puts the risk right back on the seller or the borrower. So if you look at it as a three by three matrix, MAC, exception, exclusion, exception to the exclusion, seller, buyer, seller. 
borrow a lender borrow so that's a simple way of remembering it so the question on everybody's mind just now is whether covid is a matter in relation to agreements that have been signed before the lockdown or which were signed even before the crisis arose but have still not been closed and i think the short answer is too early to say and as of now if there was a decision to be made today the answer is that it is unlikely to be a mat on a typical mat clause because of one unclear duration and it is unclear as to how broad the impact is going to be on industry or the global reach of the covid crisis but i think you should watch this space because things can change maybe a few months from now if the feeling is and if the evidence is that it is going to continue for longer that it is having a disproportionate effect on certain companies then you will find that the answer may be different from the answer today further for contracting lawyers deal parties and arrivals uh, and and uh, for transactions which are being put together you have to really think hard about how you are going to craft the material adverse change clause and particularly the exception and the exception to the exception as you want to sign an agreement say next week if you are signing an agreement next week you now already know about covid you know about the pandemic what you probably don't know is whether there will be a second wave what you probably don't know is whether there will be multiple lockdowns things of that nature but the the pandemic world or the covid world and the concept of and the and the uh, art of the possible is something which is known to you so it's now going to be a specific risk allocation question and the basic rule will be once you sign an agreement and you bind yourself to a contract you will be held to it just because covid or the pandemic sounds like a horrible thing that has happened is absolutely no excuse for why you should be relieved from the contract so it takes a philosophy of uh, and the key uh, sort of key impact of the force majeure and the frustration type of thinking and it carries it forward into this character into this contracting framework as well uh, ironically most material adverse change clauses which are well drafted which are sort of good lawyering as i call it would typically have pandemics in the exceptions uh, and therefore the risk is on the buyer uh, a buyer would not be able to uh, claim material adverse event uh, on the ground of pa of pandemics or if i can go back a certain number of years terrorist attacks after 911 almost every mat clause would have an exception uh, to for a terrorist attack so there are eight or nine categories there are natural events there are non natural events there are regulatory events and things of that nature so the the the, the principles of uh, post major and frustration and the many examples that have evolved over case law have been taken and put down into little transactional or corporate nuggets and incorporated in the definition usually of exceptions and or in the exception to the exception typically uh, market or industry risk is carried by a buyer and it is usually the philosophy of this is that when it is company specific say in the case of a, a m&a transaction if it is a risk relating to the target or it's a risk relating to the seller the seller has to bear the risk uh, and a buyer would have the ability to to walk out of the contract if something terrible happens to the seller specifically but if something happens to the world at large a pandemic or an earthquake or something usually the seller will not because it is not specific to the seller it is something which a buyer takes into account because that's a risk allocation it's a very bad thing to happen but the question that's not the question we are trying to answer the question that you're trying to answer is in a typical mat construct or a typical transactional construct who is the party that should bear the pain who is the party who should be be held to account so these are very heavily negotiated and ordinarily they would not have a financial threshold uh, very rarely would you find a mat event which has a financial threshold which is used in a kind of a lower case context and it is left for the court to decide what is a material adverse event uh, and the courts would apply both a qualitative and a quantitative test uh, there is no bright line test to this 
and it is again all in the facts and circumstances. It's a very fact-based inquiry, and I think the, the, the key principle is: has the material adverse event substantially threatened the earning potential? If you think it's in an MNA, in an M&A transaction, whether it has threatened the earning potential in a durationally significant manner. So it has to have two elements to it. Uh, substantially, uh, it should have a substantially threatening effect, and it must be durationally significant. The, there are many cases, uh, but the most uh, significant one is the case of Fresenius versus Acon, uh, and it is probably the defining case which lays down the law on this. And in that case, and I'll talk about that case, uh, uh, the facts of that case in a bit. Uh, the, the key principle there, MAC event was upheld and Fresenius was allowed to walk out of the merger agreement on the ground that an MAC had arisen. So the two key principles were that there was a longer term perspective, the definitional MAC had been invoked, a mere short term hiccup was not uh, what was recognized, it was something which was deep and impact. Now how is MAC going to affect, when, before I come to the Fresenius and Acon case, what is the effect that uh, this provision is going to have on M&A deals or private equity deals? What are the questions that my firm are being asked today in the main? Uh, where agreements have been signed, uh, we are being asked by investors or buyers, can we walk out of this deal now? Look, the whole world has changed. The world is coming apart. Uh, it's such a bad thing that you can't open a newspaper without uh, uh, without reading uh, reading something about COVID or the deep economic effect. GDP is uh, fallen to 1%. It may even become minus. If this is not mad, what is? But that's a prima facie view. I think the, re the, the, the real view is that you have to see in the contract what was the risk, uh, risk allocation. And if it is a condition that affects the world at large or the industry at large without a disproportionate effect on this specific target, it is hard both to claim cost measure for the events that, uh, for the reasons that uh, Dr. Singhvi mentioned. And in a MAC clause, again, it all depends on the drafting uh, uh, for claiming, uh, claiming a MAC event. But finally, of course, everything will depend on the words of the contract. The difference between good lawyering and bad lawyering will become uh, uh, evident. Uh, if, uh, if there is a MAC clause, but there are not enough exceptions, and if pandemic has not been uh, carved out, it's a different ball game. If pandemic has been carved out, it's a different ball game. If the exception specifically provide that the exclusion does not apply where there is a disproportionate effect to that company, then again, you're back in the game. So that's, I, I think how it's really, it's a kind of a ping pong between the buyer and the seller or the lender and the borrower. And it, it all depends on which side of the court uh, of, the, uh, of the fictional tennis court that the risk ball actually lies at that point of time. So what will sellers want now? Sellers will want uh, deal certainty, but they will insist that things like this, uh, like pandemics or acts of terrorism or things of that nature are, are, are carved out. Now let me talk a little bit also from a practical point of view of the impact on uh, insurance uh, because uh, insurance is one way where you can park risks. Uh, as far as reps and warranties insurance is concerned, I think it's fairly certain that you're not going to get any more insurance on this for, where, for two reasons. One is the premium will be way too expensive. And usually insurance is given for known issues. Uh, sorry, insurance is not given for known issues. Now pandemics, COVID, things like that are known. And consequently, the chances of getting insurance for it are, uh, are very, very difficult. Let me turn a little bit to the impact on financing. One would also typically find uh, MAE provisions in financing contracts, whether it's, le it's lending, bond offerings of that nature. And it just, the difference between the period between signing and closing is where uh, this becomes relevant. But a lender's approach and a buyer's approach are different. A buyer in an M&A transaction and the way a court would look at it is what is going to be the impact of this on the long-term earnings or the long-term potential of, uh, uh, of, the, of the MAE event. Whereas a lender is going to look at it more from 
a short term ability to pay am i going to get my money back will it impact the ability of the borrower for debt service and there's an interesting twist where an mna situation and a financing situation can happen at the same time how uh, in an mna transaction particularly large mna transaction there is a financing piece as well uh, a buyer who finance a part of the acquisition from their own resources but would also borrow from a lender for com- for payment of the uh, purchase consideration the interesting twist is where a lender uh, in a lender may have one particular view of uh, a, an occurrence of a mac event and a buyer may have a different view and the court may also apply different so it is possible that a lender may say that the occurrence of the mac uh, excuses it from financing and therefore will not provide the finance but another court or a cognate proceeding it may be held that the buyer would be required to complete the transaction so buyer is stuck in as much as the buyer has to go ahead with the transaction but the money has run out because the financing has been declared as a, 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 a has had a mac event and the lender has walked away rightly so for the same set of facts and it can happen now itself so in this case there would be an interesting question of a uh, a reverse break free uh, might arise a break free is typically given if a seller backs out uh, of an agreement uh, on the on whatever ground and then has to pay a fee for as a kind of a price or a penalty for not going ahead with the transaction and then a reverse break fee where in this case if a buyer uh, is unable to finance the transaction and has to terminate the contract there might be a reverse break fee as well so as you can see while there is a general background of jurisprudence and how courts will treat events sophisticated modern day transacting and contracting and mna agreements and financing agreements have actually taken all these learnings and created specific risk modules and provisions and mechanisms and tools uh, in agreements in which they can play this risk ping pong between the two parties and push it's like a game of cards where the pack of cards represents a bundle of risks and what you're trying to do is to push all the bad cards on the other guy and the other guy is trying to do exactly the same in reverse and it's ultimately when the some balance is found and who finally wins will depend upon how that kind of pile stacks up so uh, that's where again as i say good lawyer in comes i want to deal uh, in very brief with the pecunious case because it is a sort of defining case on this and it's a fairly recent case uh, by the uh, court of chancery in the state of delaware um the fa- the brief facts in this case uh, involved pecunious cabbie uh, uh, who was the buyer and they were uh, planning a merger with uh, with acom which essentially it was the nature of an acquisition where they uh, uh, if the transaction went through uh, the shareholders of uh, econ would get receive 34 dollars per share the agreement was signed on 24th april 2017 one year period uh, and they agreed to complete the transaction uh, uh, within a period of one year and an outside date if the antitrust approval was not obtained uh the uh, there were a set of representations and warranties that were given as to the financial condition of the uh, of econ the target the typical provision that between signing and closing uh, business would be done in ordinary course and there would be no material adverse change set of cps to be uh, to be complied with on the date the agreement was signed uh, ironically uh, econ also put out Uh, its financials which were great and they put it out on the same day and it was a, a very good prediction whistle blower complaint uh, which made various allegations that the business was not conducted in the uh, ordinary course and again to cut a long story short just two days before the long stop day sesunius said that a material adverse change had occurred and terminated the agreement this led to a suit for specific performance Uh, by econ against presunius asking them to, uh, to to perform the contract presunius said mac costless termination i am out uh presunius won on facts it was a very fact based event and one of that was that there was the lack of regulatory compliance 
and the actual uh, uh, deterioration in financial performance in a permanent sense was constituting a mac and the parties were uh, uh, and fashionists were allowed to walk away this is an interesting and unusual case also because uh, 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 because ordinarily even the us courts have not uh, upheld mac and more often than not just like in force major case they apply a high standard but this is one of those rare and eloquent cases where a mac event was upheld the principles of law which are relied upon in this are very interesting because it kind of defines how this allocation takes place what are some of these very simple contracting and negotiating principles first and foremost a typical ma clause that is the basic ma 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 clause allocates general market or industry risk to the buyer and the company specific risks to the seller what does this mean it typically what it means is that is if there is a general kind of economic downturn or if things go bad generally speaking tough luck for the buyer he'll still be required to construct the contract uh, to to perform the contract however if a specific very bad event happens to the company or to the seller uh, to the target company and therefore from the seller's point of view uh, uh, the deal changes then it's a risk that has to be borne by the seller and the buyer would be able to therefore invoke a mac and walk away from the transaction the court also eloquently the the delaware court eloquently also in a very broad jurisprudential sense lists out all categories of risk in essentially four buckets the first is systemic risks which are beyond the control of all parties even though one of the parties may have had the ability to cushion some of the effects but it affects everybody so the systemic risks the second are what are called indicator risks which signal that an ma is coming it's coming uh, for example a stock in this uh, a fall in the stock price or a credit rating downgrade or a, uh, a default on some payment obligation so these are proxy indicators that something bad is about to come and those are sometimes also provided for and then there are specific agreement risks which arise when a transaction is announced for example if all the employees or senior employees start running away usually these three risks are borne by the buyer this is not a good enough reason for a buyer to walk away and then there is the fourth category which are business risks which are arising from the operations of the party's business where the seller is still in control the seller is still running the business and which the part which the seller or the target has control over these are the obvious business risks that are associated with the ordinary cause of the party and it is th in those cases that it is the seller who bears the risk a buyer will have an out so uh, this very nicely this gives a kind of drafting guidelines for how you should construct an mae clause in this you take the bundle of risks you may you make two piles buyer risk seller risk and allocate them uh if it is a risk to be borne by the seller it should fall either in that first bucket of the basic mae clause or the exception to the exception and what we want to leave uh, for the buyer you leave in the middle category for uh, for the exclusions so this is a kind of a broad overview of uh, the uh, the current kind of uh, both jurisprudential as well as contracting regime for mac and mae law uh we as a uh, as a practical matter we are seeing this play out live in the market where private equity investors are asking us to examine uh whether an ma is because they have not yet parted with the check the check is still sitting um, in their pocket and how they should go about this what will typically of course happen is parties will sit down and renegotiate at the new price and some new conditions and they will usually if, if there's a, a sensible counterparty they will sit down negotiate and find a way forward and in cases where that is not the case there will be a fight and as uh, dr singh we said i think you will land up with uh, the court having to invoke these principles and uh, uh, and determine what in an indian context would be how these clauses uh, uh, would apply so i'll stop uh, here uh, i have um, i hope i've been able to give you a broad perspective Uh, of an MAE MAC regime and how it impacts actual transactions 
uh, both whether it's a uh, it's an M&A transaction, an acquisition transaction, a private equity transaction, or a financing transaction. These are contractual fictions uh, and instruments that have been created. But at the back of our mind will always be the contracting law, whether it's Section 3256 or how uh, common law or Indian statute, in Indian law has uh, has dealt with this. And this is where I think the skill of a uh, of a contract or a corporate lawyer in constructing a contract, a contract comes in and eventually when things end up in a fight of how you will uh, navigate your way out depending on who you're representing. The good news or the bad news as the case may be is that it's very fact specific. Whilst you have the principles of law to help you, everything will depend on the facts and how you marshal the facts to show whether you, which, which part of the contract you follow. So I will stop here and um, maybe get into a few Q&A uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with Dr. Singh and then we'll open it up. I, I can see that there are 72 questions that have already been uh, received on the chat. So um, first question on force major and frustration. In your view, do you think a force major event has occurred in India and why would you classify it? Is it an act of God or a natural calamity? And I'd also like you to deal with this conspiracy theory that are going around that the virus has been subjected to human intervention and will that change the assessment? So it's a sort of first broad question. To you. That's an interesting question. Of course, before I answer that, I must tell you that when you uh, mentioned this webinar, I happened to read about MAE as well. And the one thing which struck me was the uh, length of the contractual clauses. Yes. MAE. And it reminded me of what Bob Hope, a very famous NBC broadcaster, used to say. That I have a three-year contract with NBC, which took six years to draft. <laughs> if I'm fired, I can live inside that. So any standard MAE clause, I can assure your viewers, are clauses drafted by people like Cyril, within which any of us can live comfortably. <laughs> They're so long. But uh, coming to your question, Cyril, uh, Yes, the answer is direct. I consider COVID to be a force majeure in any sense of the term. Uh, we can quibble about act of God, natural calamity, but just on the exact question of whether it is act, uh, whether it is force majeure in the jurisprudential, understandable English language or legal sense, I think there would be hardly any court which would agree. There are, of course, exceptions, but I mean, I'm giving you a general answer. Number two, it's a very interesting supplementary question about the Chinese aggression through virus. Um, look, first and foremost, we have to reach the stage of credible evidence anywhere by at least a primary finding by any court of law or at least an attitude authority. Now, we all know that uh, uh, the first time a state of U.S. has filed a X billion dollar claim, but many individuals have already filed. Now, when and if a court finds even those proceedings, which are of course US centric, then you may have that argument coming up. But I think for purposes of uh, effect of majority, very few courts, at least in the Indian context, will deny relief, not on the ground of whether they can deny a frustration law or not, but whether the ground is not at all natural calamity or is not at all frustrating. That I think is unlikely. Despite that finding, which is of course far in the future, in the womb of the future. So it doesn't really alter the situation. Yeah, I believe the US is also is trying to send a, uh, an investigating team to China to figure it out. If the Chinese let them in, we'll see. But um, I think that the analysis must proceed on the basis globally that it is actually a um, uh, a force major event of, uh, and a natural calamity rather than a man-made one. And I, I, I suspect that in the coming weeks, we will find judgments all over the world in multiple countries who deal with this. And you probably get judgments both ways, uh, where uh, force major has been given, is, is accepted as a reason for relieving party from the contract and the other way as well. So I think the, the, the world on the doctrine of frustration has been disrupted well and truly. We'll see a lot of new case law coming. So next question on the tenants and the landlords. Do you believe that at this moment, at the sort of state of play, you uh, believe that uh, tenants will have a valid excuse 
to get some relief from payment uh, of rent because this is one of the top most i think what are people worried about one they are worried about costly rents and there are three categories one is residential and the second is office space and the third is things like malls and they are all evolving in three different directions on rent exclusion or waiver i think you're going to have cases falling on each side and possibly in the current case context falling more in favor of those who seek excusing on frustration <laughs> i don't think it's going to be based on the principles of law which i have called up uh, i think as i said the what i have told you theory is specific what will happen in practice is relative practice. and i that's think the, equity will play a big role equity yes. because finally that's, i guess judges are why, that's why they say that law the life of law is not logic the life of law is experience uh, we tend to think of it as logic that's the way it should be but the life of law the life blood of law is ultimately experience more than logic however um, you know where there is a contest it will take a long time and therefore waiver or diminution is possible where you can show complete impossibility of usage uh, but whether by the time you get to that stage what will happen to your tenancy the man will file eviction eviction stay and then other related issues of tenancy can you walk out of lock in can you abrogate the tenancy can you renounce the tenancy on the latter three points i am very clear i don't think force people will excuse the tenancy altogether yes sir. what i have said on a more optimistic note is limited to the diminution or waiver of tenancy i mean not not talking of consensual waiver or consensual diminution we are talking of contested diminution a court may say that the entire block was physically impossible to use by lockdown clearly it's a legally compulsory event and therefore we give waiver but for tenants to think that they can avoid tenancies avoid security deposits avoid uh, lock ins i don't think under normal principles of final decisions of courts that would be a valid approach a number of uh, parties and many of them may be listening in on this call have entered into long term construction agreements or concession agreements uh, which require performance over uh, many many years uh, for example an agreement to supply power or an agreement to uh, run an airport or all, uh, essentially long term agreements now what would your uh, uh, assessment be in cases if say the lockdown were to two events one is if the lockdown continues say beyond 90 or 120 days and secondly the kind of permanent change to habits uh, which which will come about for example travel i don't think travel is going to be the same ever or i don't think watching movies in a theater is going to be the same ever uh, even if the lockdown is lifted it's going to be a very long time and almost unless there is either herd immunity or Uh, or a vaccine is found this is going to go and sit in a dark theater again to eat popcorn and watch a movie and therefore just looking at it from the point of view of uh, uh, of a, of a sort of a theater operator or an airport operator or a supplier of uh, infrastructure and these are essentially very long term kind of arrangement how would you view this uh, whole development in the context of uh, force majeure let me give you a larger answer first and then the legal answer because your question is now a legal question alone uh i like the philosophical undercurrents of covid so many things this teaches us about uh, spartan living gandhi ji's self sufficiency loading the earth less and less but let me tell you that the consumer question you ask it's a hypothetical answer we don't know which way it will go but let me tell you my own view is that essentially human beings are social animals and within 3 months to 6 months you would certainly not have people preferring netflix to malls and movie theaters within 3 months to 6 months in fact that's a long period because public memory is astonishingly short the moment what is keeping you back is not the long term lessons which you are this is my view it's a subjective view as you know yeah. it what is keeping us back uh, 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 sirin is not the longer larger lesson which should be the underlying philosophical subtext what is keeping us back is the fear of the unknown the moment that fear starts diminishing which is bound to diminish with phased wise and 
full lockdown elimination, you will find that essentially that's the difference between a lot of other species and us. We love our popcorns and cinema halls. A very top number one India uh, that uh, small theatre owner or the multiplex owner said that our statistical survey shows that in fact they will want more with a vengeance to go out. And uh, a lot of industries are expected because there's also a lot of optimism that there will be a boost. For example, car and vehicle manufacturers have projected a boost because people will start wanting to use less public transport. But still, yes. go out. going out is an essential human genetic trait. I think it's very difficult to control. Once the danger is over, yes, in the immediate aftermath of the danger till you are not sure. Uh, and let me tell you that uh, herd instinct, etc., you will forget after this lockdown opens up. You have more narrower issue about long-term contracts, the legal answer to it. Uh, see, the answer to all kinds of contracts, this is a very important legal answer, whether it is supply contract which you mentioned or tenancy contracts for that matter or other third kind of contract, any number is possible. We are forgetting three elements which I must emphasize now I'm law, I'm not on society. A, remember the words impermanence, non-permanence and temporariness. 60 days in law, and this is like 500 years of law, is temporary. Large degree that's of mobility will come after. So I think that's one test of law which will negative such pleas. Two, the negativizing of this pleas will be building the realm of walking away from the contract. So you shouldn't shop want to walk away with Singhvi's contract because you think it is too long a gap and you don't want to do Singhvi's contract. Singhvi wants to force you to do it. Singhvi would have a case on the ground that yes, I am giving him extenuating benefits for 60 day period. But this contract doesn't become a new contract after 60 days. So in that fact situation of supply where you can show a complete link between the original contract and the post 60 day contract it will become a new scenario. Then yes, otherwise in 90% cases, no. Uh, for example, a contract is to complete a building for a massive uh, sports event happening after 90 days. And those 90 days are taken up by COVID and the sports event is not going to happen at all. And the entire contract says that the event is being done only for make this going for building. That may be a different case, a rare case. But so long as the very word long term actually militates against force measure. The very word which you are using will be militate okay. against force measure. Interesting. On this note, I would also like to add a, a practitioner's nugget on um, change in law clauses. And you would typically find them in long term concession agreements. So apart from finding a force majeure clause or a MAC clause, one of the other clauses that you would find are change in law. They're kind of a variant of, uh, or a mutant of, to sort of use the, uh, the current terminology, they're probably mutant of, of MAC, where if there is a change in law, and I think lockdown would probably be one such, where in those cases, instead of excusing a party or avoiding the contract, the, the terms of the contract are adjusted by a self-built internal mechanism, whether for damages or for uh, a modified term, whether there's a kind of a recalculation of the commercial impact by an inbuilt kind of semi-automatic uh, mechanism. And if parties don't agree, then maybe some assessor will look at it, things of that nature. So that's another invention, uh, really, of uh, transaction. But this is a bit more of the project finance lawyers who are a slightly different species from uh, the MNA lawyers, and they, uh, they, they, there is a lot of that as well. And it was there in Energy Watchdog also. No, I want to just add to this that I observed in my opening part, and let me take a minute on this, what you said, that uh, first of all, remember, technically in law, frustration and change in law are slightly different. Yes. Change in law is a specific contractual agreement. Basically, change in law seeks to put you into the same position as you would be without the change in law. And for change in law, I have already in my opening part said that for a construction contract, a paradigm example, 99% of which have change in law of course. Lockdown would clearly be changing. I have no hesitation yeah. so fine. COVID is not the frustrating event there. Lockdown is yes. the change in law. Because lockdown is brought about by disaster. Again, whether the change in law has been defined, I mean, usually it would it will have some durational significance. So if it is yeah, a permanent because, or a temporary. Because the lockdown or cessation of construction activities or cessation of movement or cessation of supply 
is mandated by law and nobody can say that the DM Act or its notifications are not law. To the extent that it is change of law, answer is yes. I flag the other question, it doesn't complete the equation. Because of the change in law, mutatis, mutandis, or proportionate period extension of time, again, I have no problem. I think that will happen in 99% cases. Probably, when yes. That would be, would be the most likely outcome. That would be the most likely Compensation. Outcome. Whether the change in law will get you additional compensation, which is why change of law clauses are made, is a debatable question. Because I think there the debate lies 70% in favor of that person who seeks additional compensation, to my view. But there is a 50% actually what the Singapore legislation is trying to do. Yeah. It is trying to give a statutory change. It's almost incorporating a change That's in law right. provision right. in contracts. So I think, uh, that, I mean, I have I had a number of questions, but I think it's probably a good time to go into the, the question. Incidentally, incidentally I must tell you, I must tell you that when you are asking me questions and when the questions will now come, I have actually received messages by a few lawyers on my phone saying that you and I are guilty of a conspiracy to do anti-lawyer friendly acts. Free <laughs> legal advice. <laughs> I've actually received this. So I said I will root all these complaints and queries to the <laughs> Yeah. Though I, I suppose both of us have made an exception on the basis of it all depends on the facts and circumstances of the case. So I think good lawyering will uh, will involve how the facts and circumstances of the case uh, will be interpreted. And I think a lot of it is factual. I agree. I think we've given uh, a very no, no, succinct... This is a lighter way. Please continue. Yeah. yeah, of course, of course. These are these are a lot of questions, but I think where there are repetitious questions, I'll, involve, uh, I'll uh, avoid them. So in the energy uh, question one from Chandrakan Dawani, uh, in energy watchdog case, Supreme Court held that if the event is covered under FM, then section 56 will not apply. Can it be interpreted to the extent that if the event is not covered by force major clause, then section 56 will apply subject to if conditions of 56 are complied with as 56 is positive law and has a statutory remedy. Uh, that's obviously a, qu a question by somebody who has read the judgment carefully because that paragraph yes. when occurs. After the arguments were over, and then he says, Dr. Singhvi raised an additional argument. That's the exact words of that para. Where I raised the argument, even if you deny me, the most better under the clause, you have to give me some relief under the section. Now, what this is not dealt with adequately in the judgment. Justice Narayan has given only three or four lines. But what he says is that where the action is relatable to what is intended to be covered by the contract, then you cannot lose on the contractual invocation and win on the 56. So parties occupied the field. He's not said it like that. He means that. Yeah. Is my so either here, you're either here so or there, but you can't. Intended to occupy the field with a contractual situation. The contractual words do occupy the field, but they don't address every part of it. You fail to invoke it in your earlier part of my judgment. Now you say that having failed on the contractual clause, you now apply 56. Then you can't have it both ways because the parties have a clause and they intended it to occupy the field and tough luck if you don't come under it, you fall off. Yeah, but you can always plead in the alternative, which is the right thing that you did. Uh, so that he, I think there is wrong there. Personally speaking, I think he's wrong yeah. there. And maybe some future case will test that because there's another reason why this question is good. That 56 is a law and it is not based on consent of parties. Yeah. Law overrides contract. And of course, what he says is that, that that law is carved out to a specific situation by the contraction. But these are academic arguments for future. Will that will, will not create a lot of uncertainty? Because if you've got a very well crafted force major or a MAC clause or whatever. That's the reason. And yeah. that is and that is the kind of parameters under which the parties have agreed. If you fail that test, you can't then suddenly pull 56 out of your back pocket and say, now what about 56? So that's the precise point. I think Justice Nariman, because it comes at the very end, means that. But unfortunately, it's dealt with it only in four yeah. lines, five lines. Yes, so, yes. future case will permit fertile yes. lawyering by either way expanding this point and then getting the answer you are giving or another answer. Because it's only very so to, your, so, to your friends who kind of sent you that message, you can tell them here is a line of thinking for future lawyer. Uh -huh. From Jaydeep Tandan, sir, while we enter into the session, markets have dipped by 2% and Templeton has exited. Please throw light while addressing the session. I don't know whether it's a legal question. It's not a legal question, but I must say one thing that, uh, and I'm not going to answer this question. I mean, this is not really it's a purely economic question. 
I find it strange that in law, now again I'm talking law in principle, that any financial entity can unilaterally announce that I will now from henceforth, like really a bank, so not going to give you back your deposits on time. Everybody will stand in the queue and proportionally get an exit and be not subject to any penalties. So I am waiting for the penalty part. Yes, your money is stuck. Your exits and your withdrawals will be affected. But unless there are very severe penalties in law, which I believe exist in the SEBI Act and in the Companies Act and elsewhere, uh, this cannot become even a small fashion because you will have a run on the banks, as they say, this time a run on mutual funds, debt and equity. It's extremely dangerous yes. piece of it. Yeah. Also, I have a piece of practical advice for some of the companies who are listening in on this call is that in the, probably from the legal or business departments, they may be claiming force majeure and, and kind of painting a very grim picture of what is happening. But on the other hand, their CEO is probably doing a television interview, uh, trying to calm the markets and telling them this is all fine, this is all temporary, and this will all go away and the world will be rosy again. Uh, and, the, and therefore, corporations may be talking from both sides of the mouth. And that what the CEO says is going to be used in a case uh, if it lands up in a litigation. Uh, and this is happening where uh, for the purposes of getting out of uh, agreements or contracts, people are uh, uh, sort of claim, claiming a grim picture and sort of doing end of the world kind of scenarios. But on the other hand, in order to keep certain constituencies more uh, cheerful uh, and optimistic, Exactly the opposite is done by the same legal entity by different people. Uh, there's a question, another question which I think has been answered. Sir, is COVID-19 considered as first major even though the same is not specifically mentioned in the FM in the contract, uh, as FM in contract? I think you answered that, but... Yeah, you asked the first, the first question. Yeah. Uh, can salaries of employees be reduced by company during this time and to what extent salaries of employees can be cut, reduced in this period? I think you answered that, but you want to I take it again? I answered that, but I can elaborate. Because this is a vexed question, not an easy answer. I told you four points, and let me be very quick. A, 90% are advisories, recommendations. They can be ignored. I'm not talking law again. Not that I'm advising you not to pay wages. B, that 29th March is law, and you have to pay wages. Because there are penalties in the Act. C, that is liable to be challenged, because I don't think the Act or the notification deals anything with the wages because this, if you read section 10, it is not dealing with wages at all. But D is very important. It is challengeable on the larger ground and I must tell you that recently, I think Indigo did a very um, interesting thing that they are the only ones to continue paying wages whereas a lot of their competitive airlines have stopped. They have paid wages for the current month also. But let us assume that Indigo and this lockdown on flying continues for three more months. How can you expect any flyer that is airline to pay full blast wages. Now, my question to myself and to people who might advise would be that suppose X, an employer, is to enter into a contractual agreement with 100 employees, say. The options are that you lose about 80 jobs. Versus we keep all 100 jobs, but everybody takes a haircut of a proportionate kind. And we keep the 100 jobs. And all the employees take the lead in saying, oh, we want to keep the 100 jobs. And we'll all take a haircut. I don't hmm. think that there is any law which is not challengeable by which the government can force a contrary result. Now, yes, in the immediate context today, you'll have to do it. You may have to face a few notices. But robust challenge where you are actually showing that the government's action in giving a peremptory general direction is counterproductive because they are losing jobs and forcing a wage is, should be challenged and said, if contractually and consensually all employees are agreeing to take a haircut, somebody 10%, somebody 5%, somebody 3%, somebody 2%, then how can you force me to pay full wages? I think that's a powerful argument. I think it's likely to succeed, but it requires a whole lot of challenges. And again, the difference between interim order and final relief. Yeah, I think this is too important uh, and it, it will get tested. Yeah. Next question by Rahul Banerjee. Uh, as Dr. Singh, uh, Singh we said, price is the weakest link in force major. Please give some example on this. Like we have a contract for providing service to a client. Client has uh, invoked first major clause to disrupt service, especially to cut down 50% of quantity. It involves job loss of 50% people who have been recruited for providing the service. Plus we have developed infra as per the contract. So cost involved. 
it's a very complex question but i guess the gist is uh, in the general uh, sense what? the general sense in which he means price i think it is advisable to read and reread these judgments and i think i am not being too pessimistic in saying that price constitutes the least important element in force with or contrary to popular perception remember the key case of alopi was a pure price case the court emphasized that we are not bothered in fact they go much further the law is onerous less commercial considerations there is no change in the contract it's just more tough for you if it's tough tough luck energy watchdog is very instructive it was entirely a price case entire case was commercial impossibility i am i am reformulating the word price as commercial impossibility and this was actually not mere price it was actually near impossibility because indonesian coal and cost of production are very different do you want to talk is, about that uh, suez canal case where the suez canal was the third example is the suez canal which is 1962 which is cited in energy law but yeah there are many such examples where these words and tests suggest that if you just come you have to show that price is the trigger but price has led to the creation of a new contract so that suppose 90% of uh, steel factories are closed in the world there's only one monopoly steel factory any increase of 1000% and it's impossible to supply steel so that kind of is a very high threshold is the point i am against protest it's not that it can't be there but the court is always saying contextually for future we want the threshold at which we allow this excluding circumstances is very very high where price is it mean only onerousness difficulty pressure and commercial impossibility shefali desai is a covid on construction contracts applicable for contracts where it is built to suit contracts in in certain cases no question of impossibility because unless you can show that you know whole contract is altered proportionate time in extension. most of the go ahead so, there's, there's no there's no about the question the way the question is framed i don't think there's automatic impossibility unless you know i mean it's something so specific that as i told you the whole thing is to build a room uh, and it has even started being built for a sports event the whole of which is cancelled or never to happen again in fact even if the sports event is merely postponed that whole contract will remain how can a small preschool and daycare keep on paying wages to staff without getting monthly fees for a period of 3 to 6 months so i think we are happy to now answer you the wage question yeah, yeah. that this is yeah, i think, this think is, the i think i'm going to skip the tenancy and the wage questions see there's something because there there's just so many of the same types okay this is a new type how would courts view force major con- clauses in contract which are entered into during the lockdown during covid-19 pandemic if a contract is signed during this pandemic can the force major clause be used for delays in performing the contract i think it's partly an mae question and it's partly a fm question it's also a very smart question yeah uh, uh, the answer would be normally no because everything based on covid gets covered in your knowledge when you enter into a contract yes and it's not unforeseen it clear estoppel against the party pleading covid uh i mean unless it's some you can't hazard a guess about the fact situation but a two person entering into a contract with covid very much around you cannot call themselves nelsonian blind eye that they did not know about covid and then subsequently pull covid like a rabbit out of the hat it would be a very rare fact situation except that except that kind of multiple lockdowns would be any a possible argument yeah, that i thought that the, the lockdown is over argument. but i didn't know that there were going to be four more lockdowns there would be a permanent uh, permanent argument there covid is seen as temporary two months three months if covid and a lockdown lasts multiple as you say are very long then yes it could be multiple lockdowns of sufficient duration could change not to the entire contract but normally the answer is no to that intelligent question uh, one constitutional question can the state restrict uh, private contracts being challenged uh, it probably meaning that can can uh, the right of a private party to challenge be uh, restricted under 191g no i don't think i think that's a little bit of a mixed up question because there the issue is not 191g or contract the issue is the validity of an ouster clause prevention of court access becomes an ouster clause so if i oust your right to go to court to challenge something the 
courts in 99.9% view it very disfavorably. The right to challenge in court is one of our cherished fundamental rights. And unless there is yeah. a very special clause in that also that is statutory clauses barring your right to approach a court is what I think the question the way it is framed would be very likely struck down. The ouster clauses would be struck down. Yeah. There is a question I think it's from your son Avishka Singh Bhi. Oh I see. How do you differentiate between contracts that are to be terminated due to force majeure and contracts that are temporarily suspended for a particular period of time due to COVID? Well, uh, the second is a subset of the first. The, uh, the judging of the first, namely force majeure, would depend very importantly on and be the single most important factor would be the temporary or the semi-permanence or the permanence. So clearly the test would be the second, the head would be the first. And wherever you can show that it is so temporary that the basic contract can be obliged to be performed with some adjustment, then you will not give relief on basic issues, but only yeah. on issues like proportionate time extension, etc. That's the long and short of it. There's a question for me, Cyril. If, uh, if contract says that share price of uh, share price of buyer drops by 20% or more, which happens due to COVID bear market, then can the buyer renege the deal? I think the uh, I, I assume this is a kind of a Mac question. The answer is probably not, unless it is specifically provided for if it's a public market MA and if there is a if there is a provision around it. But ordinarily, from my experience, this would not be an excuse. Once you signed up, once you made an open offer, uh, because he's talking of a publicly listed company, uh, then it's not possible to walk out of the contract. And there are decisions of there are decisions of the Supreme Court in the case of Nirma. Uh, where uh, the party was not allowed to, the only condition you can walk out is if a regulatory approval is not received. Uh, if uh, Vinay Subramaniam, if a FM clause is silent on providing any sort of notification opposite party, is provision of notification still required for invoking FM or mere existence of an FMB now? I think there would be a notification requirement, but what do you feel? I mean, I you'll have to claim, you have to plead it. No, I didn't hear the last part of the question. Yeah, so his question is, do you need to provide a notice or is the mere fact that an FM has occurred, no, you no, can no. behave as if you're no, kind no. of, condition, you have to invoke it and yeah. there's a condition burden on precedent, you. In fact, there is condition precedent in that where actually it has happened, but you've not invoked it, you're denied relief. Cases are there where there is a genuine FM, but you've never invoked it. And therefore, in many cases, of course, these are all old cases, as I said, COVID is going to add to jurisprudence by a new approach to frustration and we may have all this old wisdom gone but yes. the old wisdom is that you would actually be denied relief in such a situation merely because of non-notification non-invocation if there's an interesting question on burden of proof uh, how does the party prove that an he has attempted to mitigate or uh, uh, mitigate the impact of force measure those are subsequent those are what are called follow-up questions you have to first get force measure accepted then you have to get entitlement then mitigation is a part of quantum and mitigation doesn't arise much in terms of one's frustration or post measure is accepted because the whole purpose of frustration is virtually absolute so the contract has become non-performable so you will either get most of what you want there may be i mean you know some very rare situations i get every mitigation mitigation assumes that you are able to do things where frustration assumes that they are impossible so although mitigation is there in the quantum part of it when you have let us say compensation arising from frustration the approach of law is to basically the test condition is frustration allowed is there entitlement and is there uh, a need for compensation then in the calculation some assessor will go into it. Yes, mitigation in a gross case will come into it, but according to me, it will be least important in a, in a, in a frustration case. A question for really both of us. Sir, even if pandemics or FM events are excluded from MAC clauses, most MAC includes any adverse effect on business operation, assets, and a change in financial conditions of the seller borrower and includes change in law. Hence, most investors could still walk away from closing. Please shed some light on this. No, this is the opposite. So, so remember, I said there are three parts to a contract, uh, a MAC clause, the basic MAC, the exception, and then the exception to the exception. So a, a typical, well-negotiated 
a comprehensive mat clause uh, will exclude uh, pandemics or things like that or terrorist events or even sometimes natural uh, uh, natural disasters from the uh, from the mac event and therefore a buyer would not be able to walk away unless then it falls within the exception to the exception where the event causes a disproportionate effect on a factual inquiry on that particular company that we are talking about the target or the uh, or the borrower so if you fall within the exception to the exception i think you will still be able to claim it otherwise it is a risk which the buyer is there uh, okay. can you please name the case on mac as your audio got stuck at that time prashunius versus econ and if you write say please send me an email i will send you the case okay uh, interesting question our company submitted a tender prior to covid epidemic the word epidemic was absent in the fm clause but it contains the words event beyond the control of party and could not have been prevented the notice of award of the epc was given during covid but the contract has not been physically signed due to the lockdown whether epc contractor needs to give a formal notification about the fm event and its impact on contracts or performance so it's in this twilight zone where he is won the tender but he is not signed and forgot to have uh, the word epidemic uh, in in the first two or three answers one answer is that you will be shortly getting a memo from me and from siril shaw the second answer is that it will depend on the tender terms and the contract terms because tenders always provide for that intermediate period of having won the tender and not formally signed the letter of award there are always clauses which treat the tender winning pre letter of award as a contract or some sort of similar clause third your third question is what we already answered that if you don't yes. invoke it i mean either you say that uh, you will take two alternative please one plea will be there is no contract i signed at all secondly assuming without considering i have signed a contract that contract is hit by force majeure without invocation according to me you are a very weak ticket and both the pleas though inconsistent can be taken in the alternative correct a question from me uh, actually no it's for you actually force majeure clauses do not generally feature in lending contract is it law or commercial practice from a force majeure not mac force majeure in a lending contract yeah because so in, in other words can force majeure be used as an excuse not to repay yeah i don't Alone. i think sir in 99.999% is no uh, even interest uh, you know waiver is a no uh, i mean deferral i can't say deferral are you know ad hoc measures right. yes but there's no question and the reason they are not the clauses are not there in such contract very simple money matters purely the contract remains a borrowing and lending there are some difficulties you can adjust the time period there is no question of avoiding the contract or together that would be a very very difficult situation. the interesting question from mansi gupta what is the effect of force majeure if time is the essence of the contract well in case you establish force majeure in a genuine case then time is the essence of no defense because force majeure is an exception to time is the essence force majeure yes. is an exception to the whole contract see the contract can be done or discharged is a word used by lawyers by performance by part performance some people say even a contract by breach is discharged to some extent similarly contract is discharged by frustration so the whole contract goes where the question of time is there no obligation left it's a costless discharge i think then they're all mostly repetitious so again an offer to uh, the listeners on this call Uh, can you can send us an email and we'll be happy to uh, sort of do a most the, I, i think 90% of the questions are on wages or uh, declaration of fm it's the principles which matter which we have covered fully yes. and yes. according yes. to me all the examples in the questions till now will be covered by the principles which are there almost all the ones i have heard okay there's a question from hemant kumar of lnt can fm be invoked from retrospective date say as the project document party forgot to invoke fm within the days agreed in the contract and realize after expiry of the agreed day party now intends to invoke after the agreed date in the contract this is a interesting variant of the same question earlier absence to notify and invoke as a general principle is very dangerous don't ever forget to do that but obviously your so called retrospective invocation is in a reasonable time of the event or during the yeah. event that's a different matter like in the case i am and, and you might day. have to explain day by day by day delay yeah it is a difference of one week etc that is i think going to be overlooked but otherwise wo betide you if you do retrospective in the sense in which you mean it that you start looking at covid 
in 2000 and uh, in, in September 2020 to invoke COVID after lockdown is over in uh, you know now for the first time etc. Then it's, it's difficult right? because invocation and notification is a very important part of it. In fact, yes. most clauses are mitigated, and I think mitigation also. Actually, yeah. nice compliment for you. Thank you, Dr. Singhvi and Mr. Shah, for the information and your time. This is the third time I'm hearing you, Dr. Singhvi, on this topic and still manage to fill in four to five pages and find some new insight every time. It's kind of him to say so. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I think we are done. Thank you again so much for this uh, exceptional conversation. This topic is going to keep uh, all of us busy for a while. And I think, I believe that new law will get developed around this. I think some of the, as you say, some of the old, old concepts will have to be modernized to look at the current situation. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. And I think the important takeaway is that not only it will get redone, it will get, I think, changed. This context will change much of the wisdom we've discussed today. Yeah. And therefore, I think this is a very evolving, a very dynamic situation, purely from the intellectual point of law, law apart from commercial implications. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And I'm going to take a promise from you that when the law changes, you'll come back again for a session like this. Thank you. Thank you. As we discussed this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time.